Hello everyone and welcome to the Wadham podcast series. Today we're talking to Dr Ian Norton from Respond Global. Uh, many of our uh, members and listeners will know uh, that name. Uh, Ian uh, was a driving force by, behind the World Health Organization EMT initiative. Welcome to the podcast, Ian. Let's kick off. Uh, you spent six years uh, managing the EMT initiative with who? Uh, how was that experience for you? Uh, and um, what uh, what what's next for you? Uh, leaving leaving uh, leaving who? Yeah, wow, well, great question, Joe. The the um, start of uh, the EMT initiative, I suppose, was was when I arrived in in 2014. It seems like yesterday, um, and six years just flew by. Um, at the beginning was uh, was a sort of a, a secondment actually from the Australian government to, to go and help uh, the WHO uh, for the first two two and a half years, and um, and then rather than come back to my role back here in in Australia in uh, in the National Critical Care Trauma Response Centre, I, I chose to stay on uh, and became a substantive kind of um, uh, role, a full time job in WHO. I think the initiative grew grew very very fast. Uh, it, it certainly uh, escalated during the West African Ebola crisis, as, as everybody uh, knows, and then straight into Nepal earthquake. I think uh, I, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of, of everything that everybody achieved in that system, um, particularly the pivot towards national capacity of national response teams. This is, I suppose, the key uh, success of the whole thing. Um, and then, yeah. WHO is under under a lot of pressure. Uh, I fully under, understand that it, the EMT initiative came under more pressure, I think, than than other sectors as well. It's a it's a very interesting place to work. I learned a lot in there, uh, but the politics uh, that that drive it um, actually worsened. I, I think in the last year and a half or so that I was there, um, and eventually I, I, I took a choice to resign, uh, mostly because of um, I suppose a focus as I saw it on, on branding of the of the WHO as a as an entity uh, above more the development and capacity building issues that uh, that governments and, and countries really I think valued particularly from the EMT initiative uh, and that I just had an ethical challenge with um, I fully understand why that might happen and we can talk about the, the politics behind it but uh, you know when an agency is looking like it's getting defunded particularly by large donors uh, then it puts more pressure on them to become more forceful in the way it brands itself in the field and it becomes a vicious cycle of having to put a, a sticker on everything because you know that if you're not visible you don't get the donor funding and that became a lot of the focus and, and that's certainly what I did I didn't believe in that sort of approach so uh, hence I, I, I've stepped out yeah and it's great to be back in Australia now uh, and really pushing now to help in, in the region, particularly Asia Pacific, uh, to start this sort of, or continue this sort of work with, with national level uh, providers and, and a lo the localization agenda. Yeah. yeah, so large, and the humanitarian space is, is quite challenging and, and it is donor dependent in, in many areas, but uh, it's good to be able to, for, for many of us, to look back on that work that you've achieved with the EMT initiative. I know from an Australian perspective, uh, many of my colleagues and friends are, are involved with NCCTRC and they're quite, um, they quite value that relationship and, and what's been achieved. And it's great to have you back in Australia. And like the rest of the world, we are confronting the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what's been keeping you busy since you've been back? And what's your perspective of how things are going uh, in country here and around the region? Yeah, we, we were sort of joking before about um, how yeah, it, it was incredible timing to come back to, to Australia and then for, the, for, for COVID to, to start to, well, I saw the first uh, articles about it in Thailand uh, spread across from China and, and of course the area around Wuhan. I, I was still on and still working effectively uh, covering some some last minute files for WHO into January, February. So I was still aware of what was happening internally as well as now external. Um, so it was a very fascinating time in January, February. But yeah, I, this, I set up uh, this this entity really to to help health emergency response. And um, immediately, yeah, we, we realized that we couldn't continue necessarily uh, in some of the capacity building longer term things uh, which we had set out to do. So we pivoted towards COVID and, and helping. So 
you know, I, I was dragged into a local response straight away. I happened to be over helping um, a, a great NGO over in the US uh, based in San Francisco area, Bay Area uh, at the time of the Grand Princess. So I was asked then to jump on board the, the Grand Princess cruise ship, uh, which it's with, with its outbreak as it floated in the in the harbor there in San Francisco and uh, effectively created a, a, an isolation response plan on board. So right back to the good old days of, of response effectively and working with CDC and the company and other local health authorities. Um, as soon as I got back to Australia, we, we had our own version of the same, and that was the Ruby Princess, um, well known here in Australia, as you know. And uh, so I, uh, uh, I had to go on board there as it, as it was offshore of Sydney. Uh, passengers had been unloaded and there had been a lot of outbreaks from that. But uh, there was about a thousand crew members on board and, and the government at the time were saying they should just leave Australian waters, just sail away. Um, and I went on board as sort of an independent body to to look at exactly what was happening and see what risk that would be. And I found that at least 250 people had COVID at the time. Um, they didn't have the equipment and the supplies to, to manage safely to cross a full ocean. Uh, and I sort of robustly advocated to the minister uh, to let them in and uh, say, no, no, we've got to let these guys back into, into harbor. We've got to do similar things that were done for other cruise ships. We need to get these guys healthy before they can sail away. And so I then was uh, managing the, the 14 days isolation and, and the quarantine approach on board for a thousand people. Um, so, th and then since then, a lot of work with uh, businesses, really that focus on, uh, I suppose, messaging and public health messaging to business and getting them involved, this sort of balance of both economic uh, sustainability as well as health of people and, and both are synergistic not antagonistic they shouldn't be seen as necessarily as a balance but but they work together uh, and then uh, this idea that um, then aged care and, and such a vulnerable area so I was I was um, asked by the, the Department of Health the federal government here in Australia to go down to Victoria and, and help set up a, a control center uh, for the Victorian aged care crisis. Uh, so here in Australia, we saw about 150, 160 facilities all infected at once. It was a very large crisis, uh, a lot of uh, older people affected, um, very much like other countries. And unfortunately, um, we didn't seem to have learned the lessons necessarily of other countries uh, when it happened to us here. Uh, and it was fascinating. It was like a humanitarian coordination issue because there were state and federal and NGO and private entities all working in the same space and and not so much a command and control model but a facilitation negotiated coordination model uh, which was very familiar to me and, and so I, we pretty much set up a system to help with that. So out of the frying pan and into the fire by the sounds of it. Now <laughs> you worked down in Victoria uh, and you were part of that aged care response and you mentioned some of the the similarities between working in the humanitarian sector and in the field. Given the contrast between public health responses in the humanitarian sector and what you've seen here, what, what do you see that's relevant around lessons that, uh, that could be learned and opportunities for the future? Yeah, so maybe maybe three, three big ones to, to start. Um, certainly, Number one, just like West Africa, just like DRC Ebola recently when I was involved down there, uh, just like diphtheria in the Rohingya camps, all those things that we did over many years, <clears throat> it's all about public uh, public uh, buy-in and, and a feeling that um, you, you, you're part of the solution uh, and not standing back and waiting for handouts or directives from government necessarily, but somehow mobilizing the population to become part of the solution. Uh, we saw it so well done in Liberia, and we didn't see it necessarily done very well in Sierra Leone, uh, and certainly not in Guinea, uh, and, and hence the longer periods of time for those two particular countries. We saw quite a militaristic approach, actually, in Sierra Leone. And I feel sometimes when I come back to Australia, I'm, I'm fascinated. It's quite police oriented and, and military oriented here in Australia, too. It's, 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 it's a debate on its own uh, right there. But, but really the public health um, public health messaging to the population. I mean, it's so key. I don't think many countries have done it so well this time. Um, and, you know, when I go back to Monrovia times in Liberia in, during West Africa, that I knew that country would be the one to get rid of Ebola first because I, I, I saw it on the street when I would go into small shops uh, to go and buy something. Uh, the shopkeeper would shout at me to, to go back outside and wash my hands before I enter his shop if he didn't see me do it. 
And I said, wow, this he's taken ownership of this and he knows that implementing that public health guideline is good for him, good for his business, and and it will and keeps his family safer. And that was fantastic. There was no doubt that's what helped in, in Liberia. So that public health messaging, I think that's a that's a truth that holds for this COVID, and it's avoiding that COVID fatigue and somehow making bringing the population along rather than having an authoritarian approach. Uh, so as a second, I've already touched on a bit, but this emergency operations center approach, um, and for me. That is all about people and ways of working. It's certainly not about IT systems and fancy flat screens and, and all of those room things. It's about, you know, give me the right group of people with the right ethos and ethics and some white whiteboards and pens and paper and you're good. That's an EOC. But uh, trying to convene that and uh, out of public health is really sometimes a bit tougher. I think we do that so well in bushfires and wildfire stuff in the US and Australia and other places. I think you see a lot of this coming in and I hope we, we contributed for the EMT initiative some of that approach for, for earthquakes and trauma responses. I mean, we move that way, but I don't see that necessarily happening so much in outbreaks. And I definitely don't see that at the local level uh, in that sometimes public health people don't quite understand, uh, you know, you know, or don't learn all the lessons that emergency services have learned many years ago. Um, and I wish that there was a better uh, public health EOC and EOC uh, synergy um, learning from those guys in FEMA and other, other emergency services. We could learn so much from them. And, and sometimes I don't feel that we, we're open enough on the public health side to those other emergency services and realizing that they have a lot to teach us. Um, I suppose the last, the last big lesson for me, it's that a rule. I didn't. I didn't know this rule when I went to WHO, but I, I certainly used it in in the first days in West Africa. I felt that when I was talking to a lot of those, you know, senior senior health bureaucrats in WHO, they were like rabbits in headlights, just staring at this this train rushing towards them, which was the West African Ebola, and and nobody would make a decision. And then I realized that actually these guys are used to, and public health in general, we are used to writing articles and publishing papers that require 95% surety and confidence intervals and p-values less than 0 0.05 and you know we need to be sure before we make a decision and you see this even today in the way WHO ad uh, addresses things like introduction of steroids and other things in, in COVID care. Um, so that's the 95% the of thinkers and uh, I said that's not emergency management and that shouldn't be emergency management in public health either and, and in you saw us in West Africa just with, with best intention, go ahead and start building treatment centers and moving on public uh, messaging and all the rest of it. We don't need to wait to, to the final. We know generally the direction we go in. So that, that's that 50-50 world. And so only recently I realized that Colin Powell came up with something around this some years ago, and he calls it his 40-70 rule. And you know that 40-70 rule is absolutely fascinating. And, and I now you know, realize that I've been doing it in public health for a while and I wish we did a lot more of it. This concept that if you know at least 40% of the facts, then you can start to make decisions. If you, you make decisions with less than 40% of the facts, then you're probably flying by the city of pants. But if you wait beyond 70% of the facts, you've waited too long. You know, there were lives to be saved or there were public health uh, initiatives to start. You already knew in heart hearts, you know, when you go tip past 50, that you're going in the right direction, just start. Don't wait to 95%. And so he reckons that 40, between 40 and 70% is the, the perfect area. It's the perfect area for making business decisions. It's a, certainly the perfect area for making emergency management decisions. And I, I think that 40, 70 rule, uh, which I use more and more, and I certainly used in Melbourne recently, um, I think we could learn a lot from that. Thanks, Ian. There's some really interesting lessons there. I, I quite uh, like that community-led and community-owned response to disasters. I, I, I agree just from what I've seen that that's incredibly powerful if, if it can be enabled. And there's probably an opportunity there for um, re-examining public health education and including some of that emergency management theory in it for the, for the future um, practitioners in that space. You, you mentioned before business and the synergy between business recovery or business operations and responding to the pandemic. What, what, and you said that they both work together. 
what's the right balance? And from what you've seen so far, do you think we're striking the right balance? Yeah, it's it's a really it's a complicated one. I, I don't think we we quite have the right balance in, in in many countries. And you know, yeah, I'm a visual thinker and explainer, and I wish in a way I could show you something right now. But at the moment, you know, maybe I can verbally describe uh, this balance approach. So at the moment, uh, we see two sort of extremes. I think in Australia here, we're seeing a a very conservative approach, uh, which has has public health rules and regulations extremely high, and in a way you've got uh, the economic and opening uh, uh, sort of side of things that the the striking the balance of making sure that people aren't now completely reliant on government handouts, which is unfortunately in the many millions of people here in a small country uh, that's that's shocking. Uh, we're, we're going into massive massive debt that future generations will have to pay for, I, I just don't think there needs to be quite such a gap between the public health rules and rules that will allow very judicious reopening of, of certain sectors of, of, of the economy. Um, so that gap means there's a lot of, uh, of wasted jobs and, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of hardship for people. Uh, and a lot of, you know, this is not without its own risk because then, of course, that funding can't go into health dollars and all sorts of other things. So it's not without its own risk. It's an opportunity cost of that. On the on the reverse, um, and not to to call out any one particular country, but obviously some of the richest economies in the world um, have have taken a different approach. Um, and I know Greg has talked about this and many others. Uh, but this this idea that um, the the economic uh, rules being very, very lax uh, and, and showing a huge gap towards uh, between that and the public health rules. So you've got a reverse separation between those two lines and at this, this stage economic fully reopened when clearly the public health guidance hasn't been met yet. That's a gap in which people die and which more people get infected. So that is an unacceptable gap as well. But that gap is you know, you could trace that. And what we're really looking for is the two lines of public health and economic uh, rules and guidance to be parallel and perhaps separated slightly with public health above, economy below, uh, but not a major gap. Because I think if they drift apart and, and the public health goes too high, we have this opportunity cost. And if you get the reverse and the economic drifts up and the public health drops down, then you have the, the, the health gap. And I suppose to go back to my public health, you know, public messaging, uh, you know, what I'm finding really is that the public health leaders aren't necessarily great articulators of, of messages. Uh, sometimes I think we should be a bit more open on this and sure we, we need the, the best public health brains to help us set some of the guidance and rules, but they, they're not necessarily always the best communicators. They're not necessarily always the best communicators to the public and we need them to come on board as we've said before, but they also are pretty terrible at communicating with business. Business is a special area and we need to somehow learn as public health people how to communicate with uh, our economic colleagues and our business colleagues. Um, otherwise, I think we're talking past each other and, and that's really been the education for me in the last nine months. Now I'm in the private sector as it were or the social enterprise sector. I um, spend most of my time talking to businesses and really simplifying messages sticking to the facts but also the key pillars of public health response and then uh, putting yourself in their shoes and making sure that the message you're, your messages you're sending are applicable relevant to their businesses and they can see how they can both contribute but also uh, stay in business and if you can get those two together that's that win-win they're looking for and then they're on board and man they have some resources and they can absolutely be our biggest ally and I just wish we could mobilize that sector a bit more. It'd be, uh, yeah, that's a really good point and a challenge that uh, I've seen in, in different places and I'm sure many are, are experiencing at the moment. But you mentioned that uh, you're running this social enterprise at the moment. So could you tell us a little bit more about what a social enterprise is and why not an NGO or, or a private company that uh, you've decided to put together? Yeah, it's, I've been thinking of, of this for, for some time. Um, it, it's certainly um, 
I, I looked hard at being an NGO. I, I thought whether whether that should should be my focus, uh, coming out and becoming an NGO. Um, but I suppose again, it's a diagrammatic thing. I'm going to try and talk through and describe. But if you can imagine a hemisphere, 180 degree sort of semicircle, uh, and like a, a pie, um, and on the one side you've got a wedge. Of, and the entire semicircle of 180 degrees is the humanitarian need, and that wedge is growing. It's just expanding. The need is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. On the one hand, you've got this wedge that is covered by the NGOs, and they're a fantastic sector, but they are donor dependent, and that donor dependency drives branding and drives uh, the, the, the demand and the requirement to be visible in the field, which again costs money and, and it just is a little circle. It's also, it's a question, can that NGO sector eventually cover the entire needs of that 180 degree arc? And, and obviously the answer is no, everybody's struggling with this and it's not happening because of those limitations. It's, it's, a, it's a section which we must defend and support and hopefully it grows, but, but it's, it's a limited section. On the opposite side of the 180, you, you mentioned the NCCTRC, the, the governmental teams that we have here in Australia and many other countries have. That was a big part of the EMT initiative that one country bilaterally supports another country or ASEAN region or the EU region starts to support each other within that regional block. They, this is the future, but it is a wedge that is, is limited. It, it, there's only so much that governments will want to offer to other governments. There's only so much political capital and and solidarity demonstration that that will bring and therefore they will they will invest and they'll fund but they'll fund to a certain part but it, it's it's a fixed sort of and an gradually expanding wedge it doesn't meet the NGO sector in the middle there's a gap and there's clearly a, a gap that will continue to grow as needs grow and so social enterprise what does it mean it means taking the best sort of intention of the NGO world and taking the best of the private sector so not necessarily the governmental sector, but the private sector who, who know how to drive down costs and know how to do things professionally and well. And you combine those two and you make sure that whatever you're doing has a social purpose and effectively the same purpose as the NGOs do. Um, but you also make sure that you cover your own costs by doing so. And, and the social enterprise group particularly try and make sure that cost is as minimal as possible on top of the uh, the actual business of, of delivering. Um, look at the UN, the UN charged 13% on everything. Now, if you took that margin to a business, that is a healthy margin. That's actually the same margin that NGOs charge. And there's nothing to say that the, a social enterprise and a private approach to that same couldn't drive that cost down to 13% or even lower and still make money. But the, the, the beauty of it is that that is an infinitely expandable section. So this is where I feel social enterprise filling that middle unmet segment of need uh, doesn't have the limitations of the other two sectors and therefore it can be one of those things bridge the gap it's uh it's a interesting concept and it's certainly um uh filled a need in the uh immediate term with the the outbreak of COVID 19 and hopefully we see more social enterprise occur globally where, where that gap is, is occurring and, and where it's possibly expanding into the future. Do you have any final thoughts for us today in a, around uh, what we should be doing nationally and internationally as we uh, continue to uh, combat COVID-19 and seek to recover? Yeah, well, I suppose they, it's a call, call to arms if we can, uh, but yeah, especially the Wadham community because it's it, it's so strong in a couple of key areas. Obviously, there are many involved in Wadham who are frontline workers and uh, doing incredible things on those front lines, and that that just needs to continue. And that's that's absolutely what we're all about. Uh, but but also being able to influence at the local, state, and national level um, policies and procedures that that first of all show that you know politicians would like COVID to be over. In fact, everybody wants COVID to be over, but it it isn't. And we shouldn't necessarily listen to the CEOs of vaccine companies or people who want to get re-elected about this. We need to be judicious about, about vaccines, make sure they're safe and, and they're effective. Um, and we don't put all our eggs in that basket, but make, make sure that everybody knows that the, the route out of the pandemic is not one silver bullet. It's going to be around for at least another 
uh, 18 months, I would say, uh, maybe maybe a little less than that, but certainly into the middle of next year or even to the end. So a total of 18 to 24 months uh, would be a very short global pandemic. And it would be great to know that at the end of next year, uh, it will be all over. But that's a long way from now. Uh, and I just feel that a lot of people just want this thing to be over and they're not, they don't want to hear that the second wave is coming, but it's not about the second, it's probably about third and fourth wave. So make sure that you're advocating locally uh, for that uh, that strategy and, and having a longer term, or at least a medium term view. And then really the legacy that we can build out of COVID, this is what we can all contribute to. This is what Bottom does so well, is convening that, that thought leadership uh, making sure that lessons are not just identified but learned. Um, this this is really key, and we need to. If we can have that in a more a sprint, I don't know if you know change management at all, but there is a sprint sort of theory. This idea that we can work really effectively. That that effectively to me is an interim lessons learned or lessons identified uh, kind of process that continues to go on that cycle of learning as we develop. Because now we know it's going to be around till end of next year. We definitely can take a pause look at what we learned from the previous sprint, which was that wave before, and learn for the next wave. I wish we could do a bit more of that for aged care. I just feel uh, that, that that's a vulnerable section of the population that uh, deserve that kind of proper uh, review and, and a practical approach for the next wave. Um, and it's not that these articles will sit on the shelf this time. This time they will actually be, be used for the very next one. So that that is a big call, I think, to say, use the academic powerhouse of Wadham to come up with practical solutions that are then implemented for the next waves that are about to hit us. Some great advice there. Look, Ian, thanks so much for your time today in talking to us. It's obviously great from my perspective to have you back in Australia and have that knowledge and expertise to help guide this country and the, the local region. Um, and thanks again for your time today to talk to the Wadham membership and those dialing in. It's a real pleasure, Joe. Thanks again. Okay, take care. Thanks everyone for listening into the latest Bottom Podcast. Bye bye.